This is Monday, September 28th, and we are at the Men uh, Morris Institute Library in Natick, and we are talking with Mr. Walter Staples. And Walter, let me just ask you a few preliminary questions, um, sort of vital statistics. Okay. Um, you're living in Natick right now. Yes. And your marital status? I'm married. And um, you have children? Yes, I have two, a girl and a boy. And grandchildren? Three. Three grandchildren. And great-grandchildren? One. One. Hmm. Okay. And where were you born? I was born in Tewksbury, Massachusetts. And did you grow up there? No, we moved to Maine and I grew up in Maine in Waterville and in Rockland. Okay. And right now you're living in Natick, and how long have you been living in Natick? About 28 years. Okay. And in the last 28 years, um, can you share with me some of the changes that you've noticed in Natick? Well, the biggest one, of course, is the downtown renewal yeah. now but I've seen several housing developments come along mm -hmm. and uh, well, the big shopping marts. Town has really grown yeah. a great deal yeah. in that time. More people. Yes, More course. traffic. Yes. <laughs> okay. And um, was there a reason why you moved to Natick? Yes. Uh, we were living in Westboro and my wife was working in Natick at the Fairway Sports World, and I was working for the New England Electric System in Worcester, uh -huh. so our times didn't really jibe, and we decided to move to Natick, where she could walk to work, and I would drive about 20 miles to my job. And it gave you some more time together. That's it. Yeah. And so what is your family background? Well, my father was uh, a policeman, and uh, he also owned a business up till the time of the Depression. It was a drayage business where he hauled freight from the railroad station to the chain stores, like the First National. He lost his business. In the Depression. In the Depression. We moved to Rockland and he worked there as a laborer for the gas works and then for a kelp processing plant. My mother was a homemaker. Uh -huh. Okay. And so was he a policeman after? Policeman early on in, early in on. Waterville. In Waterville. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And he decided that was not a good job for No, him then he had his own business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so um, when and where did you enter the military? I was, I was uh, in the draft and my number in the Selective Service Act came up in April. I was working for the Central Maine Power, for the, yeah, Central Maine Power Company in Belfast, Maine, and I was taking a military pilot training course in Augusta, so I proposed to the draft board that they defer me three or four months to let me get my pilot's license. So they did that, I got my license, and then I volunteered to go, and I entered the service at Fort Devens, Fort Massachusetts. Devens. And what year was that? 1941, 19 August 2. And so, why um, did you, were you able to choose the branch that you were going to enter into, or? Well, yes and no. Uh, I had had a three-year enlistment in the Maine National Guard in the 240th Coast Artillery Regiment. So they had me down as a candidate for field artillery. Mm -hmm. I was actually on orders to go to Camp Wallace, Texas, 
but I had a, a flying license and I wanted to fly. So I saw the lieutenant in charge of assignments and he said, no way, you're going to Coast Artillery Basic. So I asked if I could see the major in charge. He said, yes, but it won't do any good. <laughs> so I saw the major and he put me on a train to Montgomery, Alabama uh -huh. to the Army Air Corps training area. So it did do you some good. It did. It paid to speak up. All right. That's great. And so you went to Alabama. Montgomery, Alabama. We were in a pool of recruits at the People's Cotton Mill halfway between Maxwell Air Base and the city of Montgomery. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that everybody was, there were mostly pilots that were there in that group, but everybody was being sent to Cooks and Bakers School and Mechanics School. So I took uh, an officer candidate exam. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I was transferred down to a school squadron at Maxwell Field, which was training British cadets. And two of my co-workers, a boy from St. Louis and one from Alabama, signed up in the aviation cadets. And they came back to see me with these short overcoats, hats with propellers and wings, <laughs> kid gloves. So I took that exam too. Because they looked good, huh? They looked good. And that's, <laughs> that's what I liked. And there was a chance to fly. Mm -hmm. So a little later, I got my orders to report to uh, Fort Lee, Virginia for quartermaster school and also to report to Craigfield, Alabama as an aviation cadet now, on the same day. 1941. This is, uh, all right, we're 1941 late in the year. Okay. While I was in the People's Cotton Mill, Pearl Harbor was attacked. And I decided then that I didn't just have a 12-month hitch, it was going to be much longer. Yeah. So then I put out my feelers for officer candidate school. Okay. So the sergeant major at Maxwell Field called me in and said, did you apply to two schools? I said, yes. And he said, well, I've got a good mind to cancel both of them. Oh. But he said, you can have one, you choose one. So I said, I'd like to go to Camp Lee, get my commission as a second lieutenant, and come back and go through pilot training as a, as a second lieutenant. He said, no, you have to choose one. So I took the cadets. And in the course of time, I became a navigator. And so that was your specialty, would you say? Navigator was my specialty uh, percentage of my graduating class at Monroe, Louisiana, was assigned as instructors. Uh -huh. And I was sent to Kelly Field, which moved on to Hondo, Texas, just outside of San Antonio, as an instructor. And or, I taught navigation, okay. aerial navigation, dead reckoning, and celestial for about two years. Celestial. Well, this is navigating by the stars. At night, of course, you can't see the ground. Uh -huh. So you take shots with an octant and fix a position based on the position and altitude of the stars. That's quite something. Right. There's quite a bit of training involved in that, I would imagine. Yes, most of the training flights for the cadets consisted of flying out, say, from San Antonio to Oklahoma City on up to Michigan, and we would use dead reckoning. Uh -huh. We would check our speed over the ground, read wind direction and speed for, with a drift meter, and check the airspeed and so forth, and plot a course. Uh -huh. At night, we did that all with the stars. Coming home, we came at night by starlight. What a skill. That's incredible. It was interesting. Wow. And now, you're one piece of a team inside a plane. Yes. Uh, later on, after teaching school at uh, Hondo 
and Ellington Field at Houston, mm -hmm. I went overseas to the 6th Emergency Rescue Squadron, okay. part of the 5th Air Force. And we were a group that consisted of eight B-17 bombers, but instead of bombs, we carried a boat, a 17-foot boat strapped under the plane with water and food, rations and clothes, if we had to drop the boat by three parachutes to downed uh, crews. We had 12 PBYs, flying boats. Army designation was OA-10. And we had 12 crash boats and a couple of hundred men to support all this. Wow. And was there a name for this group of people? What? Yes, the 6th Emergency Rescue Squadron. I, uh, I made a note of our flight overseas. It might be interesting to you. We went to Georgia, to Savannah, for bomb site training. Following that, we went to El Paso, then to San Francisco, and then we took off to Hawaii. This flight to Hawaii was by Celestial. We flew at night on a Saturday night. From Hawaii, we flew to Christmas Island, to Canton Island, to Tarawa, to Guadalcanal, to Finchhaven on the southern tip of New Guinea, to Biak at the northern end, then into Mindaro in the Philippines, and Leyte, and finally to Clark Field, which was our station. Clark Field was where you were stationed, and around what time was this, what year? This would be in February of 1945. 1945. Now, the war has been going on? Since uh, 19, oh, 1941, December 7, about four years, right? And this flight, how long did that take you? Did you stop in We between? flew at each, each of these islands, most of them was a coral atoll about a mile across. Mm -hmm. And we did have some help in that there was, in the early parts of the trip, Loran uh, radar navigation available. We had a master station and a slave station, and we could plot a fix with two lines. But you had to hit that one mile spot after flying a thousand miles. Each leg was about a thousand miles. So it took perhaps 12 days to get there. Wow. And how many people were in your plane with you? Ten. The crew was ten. Ten, ten crew members. We had a pilot, co-pilot. I was the navigator and also the bombardier, mm -hmm. known as a toggle deer, because all I had to do was flip a toggle and drop that boat. Uh -huh. And we had a radar operator, a radio operator, waste gunners, two of them, tail gunner a flight engineer, and a ball turret gunner. Uh -huh. It's a total of 10. Okay. And on your way over, was it pretty uneventful? Well, it was pretty dull, actually, except for searching for that little atoll. Uh, I do remember in Guadalcanal, the natives were pretty weird looking. They're dark skinned, and they have brown, fuzzy hair. Mm -hmm. By then, we had taken Henderson field and things were quiet. Uh -huh. But mostly the trip was rather dull. Uh -huh. Had to shave with cold salt water. Uh -huh. Not too many amenities. <laughs> you may do with what you had, huh? That's right. Um, now, were you ever um, in your plane, were you, ever, you were sent out on rescue missions. Were you ever in yes. the middle of combat? Yes. Uh, I have a total of 220 combat hours. And it was the policy of the 5th Air Force to award one air medal for each 100 combat hours. We were hit once by shrapnel, 20 millimeter shell from a Japanese frigate. We just happened to stumble over them on our way to Swato in China. And uh, two waste gunners were injured, but the rest of us made it okay. 
So we hightailed it out of there and back to our base because we weren't equipped right. to combat them. And so what would they do at that point? <clears throat> we did have, excuse me, we did have machine guns. Mm -hmm. I had one up in the nose and we were gunned all around. And when we were orbiting, most of our rescue missions were in connection with Navy submarines. While we were or orbiting, we would fly over them, circle over them at about a thousand feet. They were known by some name with an L in it, so the Japanese couldn't pronounce it. Lonesome Lulu was one. Mm -hmm. We called our code name for the B-17s was Jukebox, and for the OA-10s was Playmate. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I lost my chain of thought there. We were talking about um, you were you were hit by shrapnel. Yes, on that particular occasion, we we picked up with radar what looked to be little islands, and we saw these little puffs of smoke around the nose and the waist. And suddenly we came out of the clouds, and we were over four Japanese frigates. Wow! So the pilot pushed the throttle forward, co-pilot pu pushed the mixture full rich, and we drove down towards them, and then veered away. And I could see those 20 millimeter guns pumping back and forth. Were you scared? Yes, yeah, somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Glad to get out of there. Wow. And so you took the plane back to your base? We went back, we reported that to the Navy, and I'm sure they followed up on it. Yeah. And so they, you would discharge your two injured members and get two more, or what would you do after that? Well, that was all for that day. Okay. And those two uh, fellows went to the hospital, and they were replaced on the crew. Uh-huh. And so you were not injured? No. All right. No. Yeah. Um, now, do you, do you feel like the military prepared you for some of the cultural differences that you'd be facing there overseas? Oh, in the area? Yeah. Well, yes and no. I, I'd say no because we concentrated mostly on our mission. We were able to get off the base around Clark Field and meet the natives, mm -hmm. but this was done mostly on our own. And in Okinawa, when we finally moved up there, uh, the natives were pretty scarce. They took all the men natives and put them on one island and the women on another, so we never saw them. Really? So it was really just other people that were in... in oh, in Japan. Uh, upon moving up to Japan at the end of the war, then we saw a lot of the local people and we probably had lectures on how to behave ourselves. Yeah, because it's a very in distinctive Japan. culture there. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. So that when really we arrived, all the windows were boarded up, never saw any women. Wow. And gradually they came out, opened the stores. Yeah. Became friendly. Friendly really. to you. Yes. Yeah, you were helping. You were, once you got, got in there, they knew that you were sort of trying to keep things. Yeah, there was no great animosity after yeah. we got there. Yeah. And can you think of some of your greatest challenges during the wartime for you? Well, I can think of a couple of interesting moments. Uh, at one point at Clark Field, I was the briefing officer. Mm -hmm. And we got a teletype telling us that we had lost a B-24, which crash-landed on an island known as Fuga Island off the northern tip of Luzon, south of Formosa, and we were to go in there with a flying boat, an OA-10, and try to rescue them. Mm -hmm. So we had already sent in four rangers. The, the Japanese occupied the island. These rangers were captured and killed. So we took a, a crack at it. We saw the uh, area where the men were down because one of them was flashing a mirror. Oh, wow. and we picked that up and we flew in, saw the crash and the bodies. Then we spotted by flying low two survivors with some Filipinos. So we put together a package of a Mae West radio, 
my 45 caliber pistol and some canteens of water and I turned to the crew, I was a navigator on the flight, and said, hand me a parachute. So they handed me my parachute and I attached all this stuff to it. And we flew over and dropped it and pulled the ripcord and fortunately it drifted right down to where they were and we had a note attached to it telling them to make their way a mile through the jungle to the shore and we picked them up. Wow. So they did that, escorted by the Filipinos, and we did land and we sent a rubber raft ashore with two of our crew members to bring them back and then the storm picked up and the waves got to be 10 and 12 feet. So I got out on the wing and the co-pilot got out on the tail and we threw a rope, two ropes, to the rubber raft and brought them in, got them aboard. Wow. There were stretchers in the plane, it's a pretty good sized plane. And the medics that were aboard, we had doctors and medics, took care of the two injured people and we were unable to take off. So we had to taxi around the island to the lee side and fortunately the pilot was a big strong fellow and he got that plane up bouncing from wave top to wave top popping rivets until we finally were airborne so we get back to clark field 18 hours after our original takeoff and they took the two boys to the hospital and we tumbled into our tents and we were all confined to quarters okay. because we left our code books on the plane. Oh, no. So we were stuck in quarters for a couple of days. Wow. But for the flight, I did receive an air medal, my third air medal. Your third air medal. Right. Now, you, you being of a rescue team, I'm sure that you saw quite a few dangerous missions that you were having to go in and, and rescue these people. Yes, we dropped the boat several times to crews that were down. The usual procedure was for the submarine to come up to the boat after the crew member got on, crew members got on, and take them aboard the sub mm -hmm. and sink the boat. But in some cases, the crew sailed that boat back to the Philippines. Uh -huh. One or two did that. Wow. And the air medals that you received, you received how many of them? Three. Two for each uh, of 100 combat hours okay. and one for this rescue. For this particular rescue? Yes. It was dangerous. Yes, it was because, as I said, four of our rangers were killed there. Sure. Those guys must have been so happy to see you. They were. Oh boy. And so were you involved at all in, in extracting the soldiers that were dead or you were just concerned with no, those that were alive? No, there was no way to get at them. We just rescued the two that were, two still, that alive. were still alive. A B-24 carries about 10 people so there were eight corpses around the plane that uh -huh. crashed. So that wouldn't have worked. They were probably buried later. Yeah. Okay. And the men on your plane, did you establish some very close relations with them? Yes, they were from all over the states and, and we went through uh, training starting at, uh, let's see, we started off at Biloxi, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. This is where the crew members were assigned and I remember walking in to the hall where they were assigned and uh, the crew was all assembled, pilot, co-pilot, radar, radio, and gunners mm -hmm. and they're all looking around to see who was going to be their navigator. So uh, I don't know how they felt but it was me and it was I, you. I joined them. So we did a few practice drops of the boat mm -hmm. in Biloxi Harbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, from then on, we were a crew, and we got to be great f friends. The officers were 
intense separate from the enlisted men. Uh -huh. And we had two B-17 crew officers, six of us, in one tent. Okay. And the enlisted men were in another area. Uh-huh. But we found some lasting friendships. Sure. You pretty much stuck with the same guys through the All the way, yes. Yeah. That's true. Wow. And do you still see them now? No, I've lost touch completely. Have you? Yes. Wow. Do you have any desire at all to, to find them? No, I did go back uh, to one of the bases where we were, a place called Florida Blanca mm -hmm. near Subic Bay, mm -hmm. and uh, there was nothing left. Really? It was just growing up to weeds and grass. How did that feel for you? Oh, well, it's kind of sad. Yeah. It was a pretty p busy place at sure. one time. Yeah. Wow. And um, when you were in the war, were you ever informed at all of, of what was really going on in the big picture? Yes, we had a pretty good pipeline. The Navy seemed to know everything that was happening. Uh -huh. And one of our planes actually observed one of our rescue planes when we flew out of Ayashima saw the flash of the bomb. Wow. And about two weeks before the first bomb was dropped, the atomic bomb, some of our Navy friends predicted it. They did. So we, we knew pretty much what was going on. Huh. And how did you feel about that? Did you feel like it was going to be something that was going to end the war? Well, all we knew was two tremendous bombs had been dropped and, and we didn't know any more. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I did have one other exciting event which ties in with that mm -hmm. because as we were operating out of Ayashima we had orders to meet two Betty bombers uh, at a little place called Swano Shima mm -hmm. and escort them to meet MacArthur to discuss surrender terms. So this occurred on the 19th of August and we took off at 7 a.m. and arrived at our rendezvous point at 11 a.m. We had one OA-10 called Playmate 33 and one B-17 on which I was the navigator, Jukebox 37, and we had about 20 P-38s flying cover. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention that on our rescue flights we usually had P-38s flying cover to protect the slow-moving B-17. But these, these uh, planes that were flying our cover were known as the Bataan Escort. This probably was assigned to them by MacArthur, uh -huh. to whom Bataan meant a lot. So we, we orbited this island at 11,000 feet and the plane came in from Japan, two planes. They were white with green crosses painted on them mm -hmm. and they came in at 9,000 feet just below us. Mm -hmm. So we came in on their wing, we flew formation with them down to Ayashima with the fighter escort overhead and they landed and immediately took off for Manila to discuss surrender terms with MacArthur. And you were the one that helped got them I helped them escort them and we had the rescue apparatus in case one of their planes got in trouble. Uh -huh. That was a very important mission. Well, it was an interesting one. Wow. And were there any, um, any incidences along the way? No. I've got a picture of the uh, plane, the B-17, uh -huh. flying formation with the Betty Bombers. Yes. And my log for that flight is at the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Field. Is that right? I have a transcript of it here. You have it with you? Yeah. Wow. Be interested in it? Yeah. Okay. 0842 started engines. 
0900 on course, we'll fly right of Ishea Island, 904 over southern tip, 908, identification friend or foe is on, overcast, 0900, abeam Okina Irabu, 0920, leveled off on course 31 degrees, 157 air uh, knots per hour. 0945, pilot requests ground speed of Jap plane. Uh, 0953, Yokoati Island, two miles at 350 degrees, ceiling and visibility unlimited. 10 o'clock, three miles right of Yokoati. Uh, considerable turbulence. 10, 10, five miles right of Toko Tokara Island, arrived at orbit at 10.28. Now, I was wrong in my altitudes. We're circling at nine angels. We were at 9,000 feet. 10.40, contacted group one, identified. 10.50, Playmate 33 departs orbit at nine angels does not have us in sight. 1054, joined by Playmate 33. 1057, contacted Batan at Seven Angels on B Channel. Escort planes not yet in sight. 1038, notified, I can't read it. 1106 sighted Japanese planes at Seven Angels over Suwano-Shima. Both planes are white with green crosses. Batan escort not yet in sight. 1108 on right wing of right plane over Asuki Island. 1117 white crosses on tails of Betty Bombers as well. 11.26, Abeam Yokoati, airspeed 160. 11.45, B-25 coming into lead position. Then two Bettys. We are on the right at the rear of the echelon. 11.51, three miles right of Torishima. 12.11, Ayashima in sight. 12.20, Arrived five miles west of Ayashima, 1241, first Japanese lands, 1300, landed, 1310, engines off. And I noted the crew. Uh -huh. I have their names and uh, where they were from. So this was a log that you were taking? That was my log as a navigator of that flight. So you were able to do that during the flight. You had yes. that with you, and you were taking the details. And yeah. And this particular log is on display in a museum. It is in the museum. Yes. Wow. And so, not long after this flight, did we have a surrender? Was that? Yes. This was uh, what did I say? The nineteenth of August. I think the surrender came in early September. It was about two weeks before the surrender. Forty-five. Yeah. yeah. Then I was transferred over to Fifth Air Force Headquarters as an operations officer, and we went by LST landing ship tank up to um, Japan mm -hmm. to Tachikawa Air Force Base, and after about a month there, I was sent home. Home to the United States. To the United States. And that from there? From there, I uh, was discharged at Fort Devons, but I kept my reserve commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a captain at the time. And I was called back in for the war in Korea war. on uh, April 1st, 1951. By then, I was an intelligence staff officer, 
And I was assigned to the B-36 program at Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas. I spent about nine months there as a squadron intelligence officer. And then they shipped me to London. And in London, I was the chief of estimates and annexes of the intelligence directorate of the 7th Air Division for about 15 months. My family came over. We lived in London. My little girl went to a school, the Notting Hill and Ealing School for Girls, ah. sponsored by the Duchess of Kent. Oh my. They wore uniforms, the whole bit. And we came home uh, by boat, and I was discharged again in April 1953. So I stayed in the reserves and got one more promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. Lieutenant Colonel. And stayed until, stayed in the active reserve until I was 60, at which time I became eligible for a pension. Uh-huh. So you really, your, your career was a military career? Pretty much, and some civilian time. I uh, was able to fly in military planes, I still am, on what they call space available, and I've taken advantage of it once a year since then. And where I've do you been fly out of? All over the world. Wow. Uh, I've flown out of the Weymouth Naval Air Station, uh, Hanscom Field, mm -hmm. Dover Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, wherever there's a flight going where I want to go. And where do you go? First trip I took was to New Zealand. Oh my. And the second one was to Australia. Then I went back to Australia again and back to New Zealand. I went to the Philippines and Guam. I went to Scotland. I went to Alaska down to the Kenai Peninsula. I went to Hawaii. I've crisscrossed Hawaii a number of times. And I've gone to Turkey, uh, Morocco, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Israel, and Scandinavia. Now this is Hit all... Them all. In your retirement? Yes. Now, that one to Scandinavia was not uh, space available, but the others were. And someone else is flying the plane, you are just in it, or...? Yes. Uh, what, how it operates is this. You uh, sign up at the base, mm -hmm. and for 60 days your name is on a list. You kept getting nearer the top. Usually it only takes three or four days, and when there is a military plane, Navy, Air Force, or Marine, going to where you want to go. And if there is a seat on there, which is not needed for an active duty military person, mm -hmm. then you can get on it and go as a passenger as in a civilian passenger. clothes. In yeah. civilian clothes. Mm -hmm. And so you go there and it's free time and you catch a ride back when the next plane is leaving? Right, uh, if you're lucky. You have to be prepared to get a motel occasionally, and frequently you can stay on a military base uh -huh. at a fairly low cost. So it's, it's a good way to travel. It sure is. Wow, that's great. Now, um, upon your return, your final return mm -hmm. in April of 1953, what were the feelings of the community and your family? They had spent time with you in London. How was that transition coming back for you? Well, it was fairly easy because I had been working for the New England Electric System between the two wars, and my job was there. Mm -hmm. So I was working uh, for them and the North Shore and other areas, so it was a smooth Transition. transition for you. My job was there. Yeah. Now, when you were um, 
in April 51 when you became the intelligence in the intelligence operations, did you actually go back into combat in Korea or did you not? No, I never got to Korea. My time was spent as the squadron intelligence officer for a heavy bomb wing of B-36s uh -huh. in, um, in Fort Worth. We took one flight to Great Falls, Montana and on to Fairbanks, Alaska mm -hmm. as a training flight. Mm -hmm. I went with them there and then when they transferred me to London, I was a briefing officer and communications officer as well as my regular job for the B-52s which were stationed in England mm -hmm. for three months at a time. Mm -hmm. I monitored the missions that they flew and reported back to Omaha. Uh -huh. So I was active in training operations yeah. but not in combat. Okay. Huh. So you got to see two sides of of the war there. This is true. Yeah, and how did they, I mean, uh, there's obvious ways they differed, but what did, what kind of impact did that have upon you? Well, I enjoyed the time in London, mm. and I took advantage of it to take my car across the channel ah. and spend five weeks touring Europe. Wow. There were places I couldn't go, but many that I could. Mm -hmm. So we went to Italy and Germany and France. Uh, and Austria. Now in France was there still quite a bit of damage and... Yes, we saw a lot of damaged buildings and the only place that we weren't welcomed warmly was in the Black Forest. They still had a little bit of a feeling. I remember trying to stop at a uh, guest house there. They refused us. Because although you were they American. had room, yes. Really? So there were a few bitter people, but mostly they were very friendly. Uh -huh. And in Italy, same thing? Yes, uh, people were friendly there. Friendly. Um, now clearly the, this military experience has basically shaped your life. Yes, to a degree, this yeah. is true. And um, how did it affect the rest of your life post-war? Post well, well, it's rather hard to assess. I guess probably uh, I had to stop giving orders <laughs> and take a few, uh -huh. and uh, I slid into civilian life quite easily. Yeah. The yeah. train. The training was good. The training was good. Sure. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. You want? I wonder that. One thing that uh, I carried on was promptness. I'm never late for anything. Boy, people must love that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the difference of public opinion regarding the veterans from World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam, do you have any sense or comment on, on how each war differed from the other in terms of the public opinion? Yes, I think I do. The, the first one, World War II, was one that everybody could get behind mm -hmm. and support. The Korean War was, uh, in a sense, uh, similar because we felt that we had to hold the line of democracy against communism. Mm -hmm. And I was all for that participation there too. And for most of the time during the Vietnamese War, I felt the same way because in my military studies, I subscribe to the domino theory that if we should lose our foothold in uh, this specific area, Russia and China would move right in mm -hmm. and communism would take over that part of the world and eventually us. But as the war progressed and as the uh, casualties grew and the fact that the war was being run mostly by the political leaders rather mm -hmm. than the army leaders, right. I kind of lost faith in that. Yeah. I was glad to see it end. Yeah. Yeah. And do you, um, 
do you feel like throughout your military experiences that you were helped by a spirituality or religion that you follow? Yes, uh, you get pretty religious in a foxhole I bet. when someone's dropping bombs. Sure, yeah. Yes, my faith was strong. It was strong. And it was something that continued for you through your whole life. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, is there one other thought or memory you'd like to share on this tape for future generations? Something that sticks out in your mind that you want people to know about? No, I don't think so. I think we covered it all pretty yeah. well. Thank you. You've had a very diverse and interesting career. You've seen so many places. This is true. And I bet that was an incredible education. I mean, do you meet many other people that have had... Yes, on these trips that I mentioned that I've taken, I always run into someone who was stationed where I was or who has had a similar experience. And is that, there's a, a great feeling of camaraderie there? Yes, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you one little story. I was in Spain on my own, taking a trip around through Toledo and Sevilla and Cordoba, and I got back to Madrid on a Saturday night. It was raining. I took the bus from the city out to our base, and after I got through the Spanish guards, and the American guards, I had a mile to go to the visiting officers' quarters. It was raining, and it was 10 p.m. So I got a ride to the Air Force Hotel, and when I got there, they didn't have any rooms. And this meant going back across the field, back to the town by taxi, trying to find a place for the night. But the last man in, was a Master Sergeant George Caffrey, last man in before me, from St. Ignatius, Montana. He had been stationed in Madrid, uh -huh. and he married a German girl while he was there. And he said, if anyone comes in after me tonight, I'll share the room. The room was a big one, had two double beds. So we shared the room. And he was on his way on a space available flight to Egypt. Oh. And we went around some of the bars in Madrid, tapa hopping they call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I corresponded with him and he wrote me about his trip up the Nile. So the following year I took that trip. And then we got together and we went about seven times to various places. Wow. on a space available trip. Together? Turned out to be a good friend. Isn't that great? Yes. Wow. And he still, does he still live in Spain? We, we still, no, no, he lives in Montana. Oh, okay. <coughs> and we correspond and take a trip once a year. Isn't that great? A traveling companion. Yes. Excellent. It's hard to find someone with the time And the situation that warrants it. And, yes. it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, what a fascinating life you've had. Thank you. Really. And do you share a lot of this with your family? Do they, do they get involved? Yes, they're well aware of this. Yeah, that's great. Any of them ever go with you on any of the trips? No, uh, it is possible for my wife to go. Mm -hmm. She was with me in England, of course, and in Fort Worth. But uh, she can go on overseas flights, mm -hmm. not in the continental United States. But she prefers to stay at home. She does, huh? And so does George's wife, so uh -huh. the two of the us two, go The two boys out We have yellowing. permission to go. That's right. right. <laughs> Great. So, anything else you want to add? No, I'm run down. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay.